Good evening and welcome to A Woman's Place, a conversation about the expanding role of Black women in sports and their impact as athletes and leaders on and beyond the courts and the play fields. Tonight's discussion is sponsored by the authors of They Carried Us and Arch Street Press in collaboration with the Paul Robeson House and the African American Museum in Philadelphia. I'm Linda Wright Moore, your moderator. The women who are profiled in They Carried Us include our guest for the evening. Where is she? Marilyn, <laughs> there she is, Marilyn Stevens, the Temple basketball great. Welcome Mar Marilyn. Thank you for having me. You know, among your many accomplishments on the court, you were an All-American basketball star in 1984 and you hold records as the all-time leading scorer and rebounder in Temple women's basketball history. Yet at one time, if I remember the story right, you managed to make your way onto a team, although you did not know how to play basketball. And on top of that, your mom was a little reluctant to have you play because she didn't want you to get hurt. Is that right? Yes, yes, correct. Um, yeah, I, I was in eighth grade and uh, walking down a high, uh, walking down a hallway in a, um, uh, a non-teaching assistant said, hey, you know, you're tall enough to play basketball. And I didn't think twice about it. And when he told that to me, I, he said, just go talk to the coach. And the next day I went to the gym. I was right at Gillespie Junior High School. And I went to the coach, uh, Ms. Bush, and asked, hey, I want to try out for the team. And the season had already started. So the first thing she asked me was, um, put your hands up. And when I raised my hands and my hands went over the door threshold and nearly touched the ceiling, she told me, you're on the team. So I made the team and never even picked up a ball. And, um, and then the next day I went to practice and I had to learn as I went on. And I had to learn by um, the mistakes that I made. And mm -hmm. uh, I made the team because of my height. And um, I come from a family of musicians and Mom wasn't having it at first. And yeah. Didn't understand, like, uh, I don't want you playing that game. It's too physical. And I see nothing but boys playing it. But um, through it all and through me being uh, persistent and crying and asking, please, she allowed me to play. <laughs> and did she ever play? Let's take a look now at uh, Marilyn in action. I thought we were going to take a look at her in action. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and we're on a freeze frame. Okay, some play by play by by Marilyn Stevens of on Marilyn Stevens. <laughs> uh, yeah, those are um, that's me playing uh, against Penn State and. A lot of my post moves I learned from um, going to the men's basketball practice with Coach Cheney, John Cheney, and also Jay Norman, who taught me post moves and rebounding skills against the seven footers on the uh, men's Temple basketball team, which helped me develop to become, you know, an awesome post player inside and unstoppable force. And so when I would play, I would think that nobody could stop me because if I could play tough against those guys, I could play tough against any girl. So. Um, and you know, it look, the thing that strikes me about this video is that every time you make a basket, you're surrounded by people from the other team. Right. I was triple team and double team. And then I was yeah. backboard like that and say, you know, I own your house, even though I was in another gym. It was just a confidence that no matter what gym I walked on, it was my house, my ball and my game. And I just felt you can't stop me. And that's the way I played with that. Um, fierceness. Wow. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the, the way that you push. And it seems to me that um, that's part of the, um, what it takes, part of what it takes to, to succeed in any sport is like 
developing a tremendous amount of confidence. Were you always that way or did you become more? You couldn't have been that confident when you said you didn't know how to play. No, I, um, if I didn't know, I wasn't confident what the things I didn't know. The things I was confident about was the things my mom taught me. You know, she taught me all kind of, uh, you know, we roller skate and bike road. Right. I was athletic, but I never really played on a team sport. And so basketball was my first team sport to play on. And I'll never forget when uh, my first game, I shot at the wrong basket. And the whole gym, all my classmates laughed so hard at me. And um, I also would run with the ball. Like when they threw it to me, I didn't know I was supposed to stop and dribble before I moved with That's the ball. traveling, right? That was, yes, that is traveling. And so I learned as the gang was going on and, but I was the tallest thing out there. So I would jump center. I knew how to jump. I did double Dutch. My mom taught me how to do double Dutch and, you know, all kind of hop starts and agility training, um, just growing up in the streets of Philadelphia, but putting it on as a team sport. So I would start the game and then they would have a sub as soon as I would win the tap. And, um, when my classmates laughed at me and they laughed at me so hard, especially the guys that was there yeah. said, I can handle this in two ways. I can cry on this court or I can laugh. And I chose to laugh and I laughed with them. And, but then I was saying, but you will never laugh at me again. And then I just um, went to um, John Cheney, Sunny Hill camp. Um, when I was in the 10th grade, my coach Ina Newman sent me to camp. So I get, got a chance to play against the guys and then um, played in the Sunny Hill League in the 10th grade against the guys. So that built up my confidence. Right, right. So after Temple, you went on to play basketball professionally in Italy and in Spain, you came back to Philly, you were an assistant coach at Temple and you also earned a master's degree. And then you broke another barrier um, sometime after that, becoming the first woman to coach men's basketball in Coral Reef, Florida. Uh -huh. Let's take a look at that. You know, for years, men have coached girls basketball, and it wasn't a big deal. But when Coral Reef hired a woman to coach their boys team, it became really big news. If you haven't seen Marilyn Stevens Franklin coach, we think you'll be impressed. She's this week's Spotlight feature, sponsored by Broward Community College. Yesterday was a good win. We came from behind. We can't afford to come, by, come from behind. We got to do what we got to do right away. Marilyn Stevens Franklin is the first and only woman coaching boys basketball in Florida. Amen. Why not give me the job just because I'm a female? Come on, hands up! Cut off the baseline! Other than being bigger, faster, stronger, Marilyn doesn't think coaching boys is any different than coaching girls. Come on, defense! Hands up! Hands up! Match up! Jay, you're right! Jay, you're right! Jay, that's him! Love it, love it! Coaching basketball at this level is about teaching, and she does that well. Jay, you are the guard. You cannot be second-guessing yourself. You got the ball in your hand. So you have to think. You have to know which way you're going to go. You cannot mess up. At first, they were skeptical of her ability to coach the boys' game. But as they won, Marilyn won over the players. Um, I remember at first when I was a little peamish about it at first, but as you learn to grow with it and you grow with the program and you play with the program, you realize that she's just as tough as any man coach would be. In fact, maybe even harder at times. Why y'all Don't Go through! Run through, Williams! Yes! Go! Go! Uh -oh, you got two wins! Come on! Come on! Five seconds! Five seconds! Five seconds! Yes! All right! That's it! <laughs> Yeah, you, you roll those guys hard. <laughs> I, I did because I, I guess it's just also what I've seen and I know you just got to stay on them and you coach the game and I was a coach who always wanted to be part of the game. So I was part mm -hmm. of the game from the sideline. And as a player, I always talked. I never shut up on the court and even on the coaching, I never shut up. Never shut up. I noticed that. <laughs> um, but you know, what sort of resistance did, did you face? We saw the young man saying, well, first I didn't know about this, but then we won. So, hey, mm -hmm. it's okay. It, I got a lot of um, 
flat from the fathers. The fathers of the players, and the first thing, their question was, well, um, I don't want my son playing for a female. I don't, how are you gonna, how am I gonna male bond with their son? And I told them, I'm not here to male bond. That's your job is to male bond with your son. I'm the coach. And then my question would be, um, if your coach had a female math teacher, would you take him out of her class because she's a female and put her in a male's, uh, a class that was taught by a male, you know? Mm -hmm. And I explained a layup is the same skill whether a male is doing a layup and the female, the mechanics and the fundamentals are the same. And, um, you know, I've had people, uh, uh, parents take their child out and transfer them to another school and come to find out, they'll tell me, oh, that was a mistake. We didn't realize it, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. with their, their feeling of because it hadn't happened before, you know, and so having them play for me, it was a bond because I told them we're family. And right it's now fun. I have players call me and say, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll call me and say, hey, my daughter's playing ball. Give me some pointers. <laughs> right, right. They recognize that the skill recognize. crosses the, the gender barrier. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we talked before, we talked a bit about how in so many ways, women in sports are uh, breaking into to leadership and into previous roles that they didn't have before, like Don, Don Staley and um, mm -hmm. Joni Taylor in the SEC um, championship, two, first time two women coaches faced off there. Right. Um, and who else? Kim Ang, um, who is now the GM for the Florida Marlins. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Cleveland Browns lady, uh, Callie Brownson, who um, was the chief of staff for the Cleveland Browns. But then this I loved, she got to be a coach in a regular uh, season game. Uh, first woman to do this uh, in the NFL. Because, why? Because the coach had to leave because his, his wife was in labor. I think that's a <laughs> wrap that up. Yeah. Um, but I think the my very favorite one of these recent stories is about Renee Montgomery, who in fact um, left the Atlanta Dream, um, deciding to, to keep going with her activism, which had started up around Kelly Loeffler and uh, her running for Senate. And she actually is one of the buyers of the team and, and really has pushed forward into a whole new role, which I think reminded me of your three Ds. Can you tell us what those are and how they apply to, to what women are accomplishing on and off the sports fields? Yeah, the, um, the three Ds, and I use it in college and my college coach, Belinda McDonald, which used to say it a lot is um, desire, um, determination and um, discipline. And you mm -hmm. have to have those three Ds. First, I had the desire, I have to want to do it. No one has to force me to do it. And then being dedicated and, and showing up and putting the time in and like going to Coach Cheney's practice after my basketball practice, mm -hmm. better at my skill and, um, you know, the dedication, determination, the desire, all of those just tied into each other. I call them my three Ds and um, it helped me. Um, on the court, it helped me deal with opposition because um, I had to play against the seven footers and they used to block my shot out the gym basically. And then mm -hmm. I had to figure out and Coach Cheney would say, well, figure it out. Or Jane Norman would say, figure out how you're gonna get to the basket. You already see the opposition in front of you. So what are you gonna do? And it made me hone my skills and become a better post player mm -hmm. because of those guys used to block my shot. And that's in life. Sometimes you might get knocked down. And does that mean you're going to stop because um, you hit a roadblock? And I call these opposition as hurdles and not roadblocks because hurdles you jump over. A roadblock says don't enter. So meaning you can't go that way, but you can always jump a hurdle. So I, I look at it as, um, you know, my three Ds and working hard, taking advantage of those opportunities. Did you ever, and I think that, you know, sometimes in looking at people who achieve as you have and, and are, uh, you know, the leader, team leaders and all Americans, 
it's easy to, to say, oh, they did it all, they have it all, and not realize that it's hard, that it's really hard. Was there ever a time in any of this that you said, you know, I've had enough of it? Or ever, any doubts? Um, I love basketball because of the feeling it used to give me of a feeling of exuberation and, and of power. And so when I would play on the court, when I would rebound, I would snag the rebound like, this is my ball and you're not taking it from me. <laughs> I have that mentality and it, and it showed in my whole style of playing. And then um, like, you know, when I would do a layup and smack the backboard as I did the layup, that was like a power that like, I, I own this. And it, but I had to learn that through getting my shot blocked, through, um, not always having the, the easy way or direct path to the basket. I had to manipulate and think of other ways. So it was watching other people and the feeling I just got from just walking on the court. And, and um, the Sunny Hill League was played at Temple McGonagall Hall is where I first fell in love with Temple University yeah. playing in that summer league. So, um, and then the crowd and then the, the noise and the exuberation that comes around it. It was just like when I walk in the gym, it was my happy place. Right, right. So, so yeah. All right. So there's basketball and basketball is a lot, mm -hmm. but there's the rest of your life, right? Yes. And, um, especially as a, a player and coach who is also a parent. How'd you manage all of that while playing? Uh, I, I looked at my mom as uh, my role model. She was uh, a good micromanager. She took care of the family, but she also took care of other people's children as well, as far as spending time with them. She always sp spent time with us in May time, and she always exposed us to good opportunities and made sure you know, we had our schoolwork, our education had to come first, our chores, we had, we were disciplined, we weren't in any trouble. And, um, but she always would take us wherever she would go. We were raised up in the church. So we were all in church Sunday mornings, singing in the choir. She played the piano. Um, so music was a part of our life because uh, we were musicians. I played the clarinet and oboe in the school band, Rats. So we had some music in us and my brothers, you know, played the piano and the drums and my two daughters went to uh, school and they also played the saxophone in the marching band and in school, but it was that discipline with the school and the arts, education and the arts all and sports all work together. So and you managed to, as we're gonna see here, um, to, to blend that all together. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at you with your daughters. Marilyn is more than a coach. She's a working mom with two kids, but this is no nine to five job. She often works 12 to 15 hour days. So Marilyn has to be creative when it comes to finding family time. Marilyn brings her youngest daughter to practice where they sit and color together. And her oldest plays on the girls team. So when she's shooting jumpers or free throws, mom is only a few feet away with a clap and a smile. So I want to be a role model for my daughter more than anything else, you know? So if I could be a role model for my daughters and show them not to give up and quit, they can have that instilled in them. She has a lot of time. I'm always with her. My sister's always with her. Everywhere she goes, we're there. When I have a game, she's there. And I have a track meet, she's there. Same with my sister. When she has a recital, she makes time. <laughs> makes time. What, what make they time. Do? They make time. They make yes. ways for no way. Um, and your older daughter is still playing? She's uh, now she's uh, a teacher. She is uh, dean at her school up in Florida, in um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, my youngest daughter, the little girl that you saw dancing, mm -hmm. she um, just received her master's degree from uh, University of Connecticut. She was a graduate assistant for Gino, who uh, at University of Connecticut mm -hmm. here. So they're in Florida doing their things, and I have grandchildren, and now they're getting into sports. So my mom always said, if I'm gonna be a role model for somebody, be a role model for my children first before I could be a role model for anybody else's child. So that's why I made sure I put the time in and made sure I was available for them and encouraged them and 
you know, education was first. Both my daughters graduated from high school honor students, and they also graduated from college distinguished honor students. And also was musician. And um, my youngest daughter, Deshu, went to college on a basketball scholarship to St. Joe's. And my oldest daughter, Marilyn, went to um, Florida uh, Atlantic University on a track scholarship. So they know what it takes. And now my granddaughter, she's running track. <laughs> oh, great. So you keep it, keep it all focused, but you make time, you need a, a work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to do is make sure my life was balanced and that my children's life was balanced. So you are currently a high school teacher. And am I correct? Have you gone back already? To yeah, I'm teaching. Well, tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll yeah. So yeah. of course she had to prepare for this. And let's roll that short clip to show how back to school is looking in pandemic land. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ms. Stevens. I teach the food and finance class. Students will learn how to manage life skills such as basic food preparation, how to get around in the kitchen, making a budget, and sewing skills. I know they're just looking forward to, to hearing more from you. What yes what's the moment about that, about what how you dealt with your teaching through the pandemic? Have you been doing remote? We've been doing remote both um, home and also on cohorts where we're going. The students will see us every other day. They split our role class list into two groups. Um, you have students with last names A through L come on A day and the students with last names M through Z on the B days. And then every other Wednesday we have um, um, synchronous um, assignments where they're home or we might have um, faculty meetings by Zoom. So we're making it work. And, um, but, you know, tomorrow I'm looking forward to putting a face to the name because in Zoom, I see our names. And I don't know what my students look like, basically. So at least to have the communication. And now when they come in, they have masks. So at least try to connect my students with their name and get to know them. You know, that's going to be, um, you know, something nice. We still got to be safe. And um, but, you know, the students need the education. We got to take advantage of the times that we have and use it wisely. So us still being in school is really helpful. Right. I, you know, it just hit me that the, the me not, not knowing your students, you have a new class coming in from last year or, you know, that are entering with and having to meet them all with mask on, you know, it really struck me when I saw your face with the mask on it, but uh -huh. um, I know you will bring the positive uh, spin to it. Um, so how does your athletic experience connect with your teaching? Um, because I, I believe that all students can learn no matter what level they are. So when you walk in my class or if I'm talking to you in Zoom, I mean, I'm one of my students like I'm their parent because I feel like I'm their parent. Sometimes I'm one of them. I need this assignment now. You got to do your homework. I'm going to follow up, make sure you turn in your work. And um, I'm really um, passionate about teaching because my mom was an educator. She was a reading specialist and she taught the neighborhood children how to read and she taught us um, you know our academics and so that's been a passion ever since I was young watching my mom being a teacher but it's the passion that you give the students you get it back the reward and so I encourage my students all the time and I don't take no for an answer just like being on the court like if I was coaching you teaching you how to make a layup I'm going to stay there and we're going to do this layup together to you make it to you succeed and I do the same thing as teaching and I love um, teaching family consumer science because I'm teaching them life skills. Mm -hmm. And last year I taught health and wellness, which was also teaching them health and about their fitness. And this year I'm teaching families consumer science. I just love to teach because I had great teachers. And teaching is the only profession that produces other professions. So we're valuable, we're frontliners and we're needed. And you need to have teachers who enjoy their job and who are passionate about what they do. And every time I look at a student, I see some of myself in them. Right. No, they they are jewels ready just to um, 
take advantage of the direction that that's led them, you know? And um, I also mentor, I have athletes in my nutrition and sports class. So I'm always talking to them about their game and how they can get better at their game, whether it be basketball, track, um, if football, if they're athlete, I'm always talking about um, mentally keeping yourself in the game. Um, I never got a technical foul as a basketball player or as a coach. I always knew how to keep my head leveled. And even though it might have got tense, I knew how to maintain control. So I'm putting that into my teaching. All right, you might not have got that assignment correctly, but we're going to do it over and we're going to find a way you're going to get it right. So I don't give up. Right. And in this difficult time, there's been a lot of discussion about um, the impact all of this isolation has had on children mm -hmm. um, and on the teaching process. Um, has it been, do you anticipate it's going to be tough, continue to be tough as long as you're doing remote or mask or you know all of these impediments to what you normally do? Well, they're making changes now because I guess they've seen how tough it's been. Mm -hmm. Some students uh, need one-on-one. -on -one. They need you to be over them. Um, I can remember talking to a student and I, would did, I did a survey. What do you prefer? Do you prefer to um, continue learning virtually at home or do you want to come into the building? And a few of the students would say they would prefer the building because they want a teacher over them and showing them and they can ask questions right away and it's one-on-one. -on -one. And um, some of the students are home by themselves. And when they have a question, they have no one to show them, you know, the correct way to do it because their parents are working. Right. So it's, it depends on what their home life is, um, you know, because everybody is sharing space now, instead of you being in a classroom where everyone is learning the same subject, you got a brother and sister in another corner and everybody's doing different things, different subjects. It could be a distraction. So this has been a learning experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the end. I think it's only going to get better. And um, we're learning how to learn and teach through adversity. And that's what we learn. And that's how life, life comes. You have adverse situations and you have to um, figure it out and move forward. Mm -hmm. You can't let it stop you. OK. so. Now we're going to have um, one of the authors of They Carried Us join us, Asaha Trailer. Her co-author, uh, Sissy Rogers, was not able to be with us tonight. But welcome to Saha. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm, we we kind of digress a little bit into teaching, but it all doubles back to our topic of, of sports. In the, um, the book, They Carried Us, uh, your anthology, um, you profile nine Philadelphia-based sports women under the heading sports, unapologetically us. And I think that alludes to some of the challenges that and obstacles Black women face, but can you explain why you picked that subtitle? Sure. Um, you know, the idea of, the, of Black women's bodies, you know, it's, it's always, you know, like you're, you're too dark, you're too light, you're, you know, your butt is too big, your hips are too wide. And it always has black women at a point where they're saying almost an apology. But these sports women, as you can tell from what Marilyn had to say, they are completely unapologetic. And you know, the way that they use their bodies, um, the way that they tie their bodies to their minds. I mean, I just, you know, the unapologetically us just seemed to really suit the chapter. Yeah, well, you know, the, the way you frame that makes me think about Serena yes. and um, um, the, the gymnast who just keeps Simone winning. Simone Biles. Right, who keeps winning gold medals like, you know, she just collects them. Um, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that you touched on about our bodies, um, we all know that for those of us who are a lot older than our, than Marilyn, that back in the day, you know, gym class was the thing you avoided because well, there was one big reason. 
hair. The hair, yeah. You would get that hair and your hair wouldn't be straight. But, you know, there is this part of being an athlete that is sweaty and tough and challenging and pushy. And that is what? Unfeminine, I think. Unladylike. Um, and for Black women, as we know, you know, it, it doesn't take long for folks to decide we are unfeminine, ugly, angry, tough. So um, um, did you, did people talk about that issue in your interviews? Is that, and also, you know, did you, Marilyn, experience any kind of resistance to you doing the kind of sports that you do? I can remember at, um, in, at Temple at one of my uh, English classes and it was, um, we were writing and one of this, the topic came up as uh, about women athletes. And, and, and I think I said something like, you know what I, I didn't like is when people make comments that so she plays like a guy. And so then my comment was, well, what does a guy play with? Why can't she be a female who plays just as good as a guy? But why you got to say she got to play like a guy? And then that used to go back and forth. And we had football players. It was a class where we were all athletes in there. And we had different um, sports represented in the class. And it was such a good discussion because one of the football players had said something like that. And my quote was like, well, you know, why can't she just play as good as a guy? She don't have to play like a guy because guys that can play soft. So why would you can use that comparison, you know, if you, if you had a player that played aggressive? So, um, and I remember that vividly while in being in my English class and a writing class at Temple. Um, you unapologetically, that, that title, that chapter is perfect because what do we have to apologize for? You know, there you go. And, and like I go. say, I'm six foot two inches tall. I like to wear heels when I have a dress on, what makes me six five. And I don't apologize to no one because I'm taller than everybody. So <laughs> why do I have to apologize? Yes, at all. Um, I love my height. I'm proud. My mom always say, you tall, stand up. And I love my height. My youngest daughter is six one and I got grandchildren who's going to be tall. That's the way of life. And I don't know how to be short, so I don't try. <laughs> <laughs> So did you find this kind of, that, that strain of um, self-acceptance, positivity through, with the, all the other women athletes and sports people you, you uh, profiled for Saha? Well, I, you know, I think that that's, I mean, I don't know how you can be an athlete and not like really believe in your body, you know? I, and I just think that that's, you know, that's what's so positive to me about, you know, the women in sports that, you know, they have taken their bodies and they have chosen to do some things with their bodies mm -hmm. that a lot of times are really unbelievable, you know? Um, and so to me, that strength is beauty. Uh, and I think that it's really time for us to, to see that strength as beauty. And I think it's happening. I mean, I think that it, it's certainly my, my role model in that regard has been Serena Williams forever. Um, She's not apologizing for much of anything, <laughs> nothing at all. Um, so um, as we were talking earlier, the, the increasingly black women athletes are, are breaking through to places where women haven't been before. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in talking a little bit about women moving into coaching and leadership, um, both in of women's teams, because they used to always have male coaches, even though it was a women's team, but moving into um, involvement and engagement in men's sports. What, where do you think that's, that's going? I'd, I'd love to hear Mar what Marilyn has to say about that. I have my thoughts about it, but I'm yeah. interested in what you <laughs> Okay, you first, Marilyn. Okay, well, you know, I was listening to Dawn Staley talk um, when, when her and Tony, they were the first Black women to um, play in the in SEC championship. And she said, it's not about color and race. You know, it's about opportunity. And the same thing goes with women coaching male sports. It's not about the gender, it's about the opportunity. You have to give us a chance 
um, I was given a chance to coach a boys basketball team and the athletic director told me, he said, you know, he slept on it for the weekend. He tossed and turned and he thought about it. And his decision was he has two daughters and he looked at his daughters and he said, how would he feel if his daughter was denied a job because of her gender? And so when he saw me that I interviewed on a Friday, he saw me that Monday, he gave me some mail. He said, well, you know, come into my office. Here's the mail. I need to give you this mail. And it was addressed to the boys basketball coach. And that's oh. why he gave me the mail and said, congratulations, you got the job. And he said, he's the best person for the job. And I had interviewed against male applicants. And so um, that showed right there, that opportunity, they believed in me. So I always believed in myself, but I said, the only way I don't get this job is because I'm a female. But they believed in you, me. And then you need somebody to believe in you to give you that chance, the opportunity more women empower positions to be mm. offered those opportunities. Because mm. mm. only that's one. And then, you know, it's, we started getting more and more females into getting involved in male sports, even on a professional level. So I see the ceiling, you know, is, is really high and it's a breakable ceiling that can happen. And that is happening. Yes. And, you know, I think that one of the things too that you mentioned earlier was, you know, that coaching is teaching yes and there you know there are plenty of women who are excellent teachers okay yes. and so the idea of whether you you know whether you're a man or a woman the question is can you teach can you motivate exactly can you get a person from here to there can you get a person to see that they need to go from here to there Mm -hmm. you know, and that really, I think that that's, you know, that's the key issue, you know, along with opportunity. Right. Uh, you know, I saw this quote from, it's a woman who's a sports historian um, named Catherine Ariel, I think it says, opportunity begets achievement, achievement adjusts attitudes, mm. adjusted attitudes then begin to erode the barriers of bias contributing to increased opportunities and greater equity. And I really think that what you are yeah. saying about when you break through and get to play on the boys' turf, um, that it, it, it opens doors um, and, and it begins to change what people see and the way they think about what um, playing like a girl really means, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think, do you think that women in sports will ever, you know, there's, there's often talk about how wonderful, like for soccer, our women's soccer team was fabulous and the men, well, they were not so much. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, men can be depended upon to be making more money, getting more endorsement deals and all of that. Do you ever think that that will change in sports? so that women can pull the same kind of, uh, I don't know, power and money, et cetera. Uh, or maybe women's power is something comes from a different place. Is that to me or? Yes. Uh, opportunities, you have, we need more women in position of powers who's able to make those decisions. Um, like you say, Renee Montgomery, who now is um, co-owner of the dream. So here she is, she's in a position of power. Um, it seems like in the past, we were afraid to take those positions of power, but mm. now you have more women taking positions of power, you have more input and you have more say so. Um, mm -hmm. You'd be surprised what can be done. I mean, it is a struggle and it's, you know, something that has to be fought through. But I think as we get women in those positions, um, a change can happen, you know, it might take time, but a change can happen. And, you know, I forgot to say to people, I don't know whether anybody wants to do it late in the show, but you can ask us questions through the chat function if you'd like, but go, go ahead, Pisaha. Um, I was just, I was thinking about, um, I either heard or read, I can't remember which, uh, that um, 
Naomi Osaka is now the highest paid woman athlete. Now, of course, I don't know, you know, in fact, there may be some women who want to go into tennis because it, it seems far more open than, you know, struggling with the NFL or you know, mm -hmm. WNBA or NBA. Um, but the, the, I think the point is that as women become, as people begin to see women as excellent athletes, Mm -hmm. And to see the kind of, see what they bring to the game, whatever game it is, um, that some of those opportunities are going to open up. And I think mm -hmm. that it's, you know, um, it's the case that exactly as you're, you're the person that you were quoting earlier, that, you know, that having people function in these roles will change people's attitudes about it. Uh, and and I and I can, I only hope that that continues. I, I certainly hope that that continues. We have a um, a comment and a question, a compliment coming in here from um, Isaac Caho Senior, um, who says she and I know she doesn't mean me or Fasaha <laughs> um, had the best footwork of any player in Philadelphia during that time girls or boys unquote mm. and he asked what was the importance of fundamentals in your basketball game how did you teach that to the next generation of basketball players well um well Ike used to was one of my coaches um you know one of my many coaches and I've learned that um, from John Cheney. Fundamentals. Mm. Um, 10th grade, I went to his basketball camp um, and Sunny Hill John Cheney basketball camp. And um, I was 16 and I won the rebound award out of all the six, all of the um, players that were 16, they were against guys. <laughs> oh. mm. uh -oh. What happened is um, they had a basketball camp and it was um, 200 basketball campers but 20 of those 200 were females and mm -hmm. it had Yolanda Laney myself Don Hoover we we were up there and coach Cheney they put us on a team with the guys and we had to learn how to play against the guys so we didn't have female players already um, that we could look up that played basketball so we had to look at the guys and learn from them and um, a way I used to play on the court when I would go to the uh, play pickup, guys really never bought their own basketball. So I would bring my ball. So when they would ask, can I use my ball? I would say, no, only if I could play. So that's how I, <laughs> that's how I earned myself on the court until I had to prove myself. But fundamentals was a stickler because it didn't make sense to waste time. Um, my coach used to say, you know, it's too much mustard on the hot dog. That means, you know, you're doing all these non-fundamental things. You're doing an a NBA move with a third grade finish, meaning you work hard, you're still not making the ball. So, or, you know, you're still not making the basket. So um, fundamentals was the key. And that doesn't change no matter how you look at it. And when you go back, the fundamentals still exist. A layup fundamentally sound is the same layup then as to now, you have to step your foot in opposition, go up, follow through. All those still, all those skills are still needed. Ball handling, you know, you got to keep your body low, just being in a triple threat position on the wing. All those things are fundamentals. That when you are taught the fundamentals, then you can play the game better and understand it better. Wow, you're talking <laughs> over my head about. What I'm sorry. <laughs> You can tell I got caught up when you're talking about the sport I love. Yeah. <laughs> so what about the future? Um, what does the future hold for women in sports? You know, like really reach out there and look into your crystal ball. I, you know, now with women becoming, you know, professional sports, um, we have more, um, more television. You know, we get more exposure. You mm -hmm. have media. Now you see them on billboards. You have professional athletes doing commercials and they're getting paid. And they're, when they sign a contract, they're getting endorsements and shoe contracts and more things that you see where they can benefit from it. 
Um, like I know um, Yolanda Laney's daughter, she's playing in the WNBA and now she's just with the Atlantic Dream. Well, last year she was the most improved player and she got acknowledged for that. So now they're bringing in and they have an all-star games. They included the WNBA players with the NBA players on a three-point shooting contest. You know, mm -hmm. things are inching up where now it's like we're tr they're trying to make it even and mm -hmm. have your tennis and, and women's sports and now they're trying to encourage it. And even, you know, even in the Olympics, as they put more different sports in the Olympics, they even have Olympics now. Break dancing is in Olympics now. <laughs> well, I was waiting for double dutch. Yes. Now, that. <laughs> yes. They need to get one for double dutch because I, I know I've seen some double dutch uh, jumpers that are awesome and do tricks and everything. So as we go out and not be afraid to try these new activities and new sports and don't be afraid what people might say because you play it and because you play it well it's only going to benefit our our grandchildren my granddaughter you know because now she has modern technology to help her mm -hmm. uh, how track runners are using the treadmill where as an older person we used to use the treadmill walking or becomes a clothes rack <laughs> Now the um, younger you that. <laughs> but now younger kids and track runners are using the treadmill to practice sprinting in the home when they can't go out because of the inclement weather. Mm. They're using the tools and they're making it work for them even better. So I say the sky's the limit and go for it and um, always think outside the box. Okay, so we've got some more questions popping in. Um, let's see, from Cynthia Barnum. Which level of coaching did you enjoy the most and why? You've been at middle school, high school, and college. I really enjoy high school because I can help prepare them for college. Once, and middle school was great, but high school had it where that's where everything count because now your, your SATs count and then now you have to um, do the recruiting process and what college you wanna to go to. And the question is, is the college is gonna benefit your need? Is it gonna get what you're looking for? Not just with the team, but for the college and the education itself. So I really like coaching the high school because I was able to help prepare them get to that next level, which was college. And mm -hmm. um, I really, in college, it has, college was great, but high school was, was my passion, was my heart. It has to do with that, that urge to teach, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see, we've got more questions. From Robin Arnold, what should be the role of allies, uh, such as Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, in furthering support and opportunities for women in sports? So I think what he's asking is ally, male allies to women's sports. Yes. Well, you know, Kobe was a, um, a, a, a girl dad. And when I was playing in Europe, in Italy, Joe Bryant, his dad was also playing. So I met Kobe when he was 14, playing against the men in Italy. So, yeah. but Kobe's from Philly. He played in the in the Sunny Hill John Cheney League. He's he's seen it where basketball you're considered an athlete, not just a female athlete, male. You're considered an athlete, and they really push for um, the best players. And Kobe was really good friends with the University of Connecticut women's basketball team, so he supported women's sports. So because he looked at when you're good, you're good. It doesn't matter who's playing it. Mm. You're skilled and highly skilled at that level. That's where the Mamba attitude come from. And I think women, we probably had that a long time ago, um, doing all being micromanagers, taking care of the family, taking care of your, um, your craft, training. Um, look at Serena Williams. She's a mother now and she mm -hmm. was playing a sport and she had a daughter right by her side. So, um, I say um, they're fathers. Those male allies are fathers. And mm. they, their daughters too, and think what would they want their daughters to have those opportunities. So I, I think it's helpful. So here's a question from Alpha Alexander. Is that somebody you know? Marilyn, yeah. tell the story of not going overseas and the importance of your academics. 
Oh, I'll never forget. And that's Dr. Alexander, my athletic director. Okay. Um, I had an opportunity to go play in Yugoslavia my freshman year when I was at Temple. So she calls me to her office and says, hey, you know, they're out, they're asking you to uh, go play in Yugoslavia. I mean, um, and, um, and uh, Venezuela, they're sending a team, a USA team. And so I'm grinning and I'm smiling. And, and she said, and I told them, no, you can't go. Oops. I was so hurt. And she said, because you got a D in your psychology class and you're going to summer school. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, prioritize. That was the last one. I was like, I couldn't believe it. But you know, I was a freshman. And I just, you know, didn't take the class serious. And after that, I was like, Doc, you don't have to ever worry about me. I did go, but you know, the following year I went to Yugoslavia and played um, on one of the national teams. And but that was such an eye opener. So you know. I stay on my students. I stayed on my children about the academics. Mm -hmm. you know, academics is first is important, and, but that's, I use that I, and that stays with me. That does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks doc. <laughs> you know, I um, have been thinking in this terms of this question about where is women's sports headed and, and will women get some sort of parity and I think you're right that, that we are heading in that direction that the, the women athletes are getting that kind of prominence. Um, and I, while we were preparing for the show, one of the things that um, turned up in the research was uh, 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 Wyoming Atias, who um, I, when uh, Sissy brought it up, she said, I never heard of her before. And I said, I think I remember the name, but I don't know what she did. And she actually um, had her own protest uh, against racism in the 1968 Olympics and wore black trunks when she ran the 100 yard dash and became the first person in the world to set a world record and then became the first person in the world to win that event twice. But what do we remember about the 1968 Olympics? Mm -hmm. We remember Boys, John Carlos standing up, yeah. With their fist raised, we 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 hear that, and you know what? And and um, moving on to that, you know, our Black Women in Sports Foundation is being honored by the NAACP tonight, and they are um, a bunch of women who had a great idea. They went on through their uh, to they, their vision, and it was um, Dr. Olive Alpha Alexander, who is my athletic director at Temple. Um, professor Tina Sloan Green, who was my professor at Temple. She also coached lacrosse. And then Dr. Nikki Frank, who was the fencing coach and also um, instructor professor at Temple. But these three ladies took me under their wing and that's who I saw. And they were, they were parents and they took care of their families. And, but then they were really focused into helping the athletes, especially as female athletes and African-American athletes, they really pushed us to get the best out of us. And they weren't my coach. They didn't coach me, but they coached me enough. They were my mentors. So I look to them as, as examples because they were there in the beginning. And right now they, they're getting honored for the works they do and also um, teaching um, young black girls to get them involved in sports. And they also teach a non-traditional sport as far as golf, um, lacrosse, uh, field hockey, um, tennis. And these are sports that you don't normally see in the African-American communities, fencing. So now they're being exposed. You can get a college scholarship playing those sports. And that helps in the education. And that helps stops the parents from having to go in their pocket to pay for education. So that's furthering our education as female athletes. So, um, they, they've been pioneers and that's why they get an honor tonight because of their vision and their mission. And, um, and Linda, uh, Linda Green is also an attorney, sports attorney, and she also had a vision with them. And um, it's been great. And we've all benefited from being involved in black women in sports, myself and my daughters. And so support black women. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one thing that I think I want, want to say, and that is that, you know, when we were thinking about uh, putting together this book, one of the things that Sissy and I really agreed on 
mm -hmm. was that it was really essential that there be a chapter on black women in sports. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only because we like sports, but also because, you know, we felt that it really deserved to be along with law and government and, you know, careers in faith and community development and medicine, that this was a very important topic that is really not given the kind of attention that it deserves. And so I'm really proud that we have this chapter with these nine women from, you know, and, and that temple nexus is, is really, uh, that's important. <laughs> that's really important. That little mm -hmm. uh, critical mass of people. Right. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that because, you know, people might ask, well, why, why do you want sports in this book? And that's the reason because right. it's important. Yes. Well, I can remember when um, in the, the, I guess, when was I there? I was there in the mid, from the mid 80s to uh, the early 90s. And I, I got to know Tina, uh, Tina Sloan Green, when, when the beginnings were happening of what grew into uh -huh. the Black Women's Sports Foundation that they're being honored for tonight. And um, it's just a... Um, it's kind of like a, 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 a continuum that people who have opportunity see their role as creating opportunity for those who come after them mm -hmm. and do the work and create the, the institutions um, that will be able to perpetuate you know, the advancement of women who follow in their footsteps. So, um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, any closing thoughts, Marilyn? Something that you'd say to, uh, I don't know, all the, the, the next generation out there that's maybe thinking maybe I can be a real athlete and where's that going to take and stuff? Um, the only person that can stop you is yourself. And no one can stop you. And you have to have that mentality that my, my mom would say we could do all things through Christ to strengthen us. And that's what I always would, would carry with me. But um, never say never. There's always a think outside the box. There's always another way to get it done. And instead of it being a roadblock, when you do get opposition, it's just a hurdle. And what do you do for a hurdle? You jump over it. So um, that would be the thing that I would... Um, say to young people, when you get into a tough situation, it's not a roadblock, it's just a hurdle. And you, when you get time and get prepared, you'll be able to jump that hurdle. So, um, and that's my life lesson. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Saha, you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, not really. I mean, I just, the only, the only thought that I have is um, really thanks to all of the women in Philadelphia uh, who have done so much for women's sports, all kinds of sports, fencing, tennis, you know, basketball. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, um, I thank them. I thank them okay. for the work that they've put in. Okay, so that's, we're wrapping up now. Um, and I thank all of you for joining us. And thanks especially to Marilyn Stevens for sharing her story. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation and we hope that you'll come back and join us again on March 31st for another They Carried Us virtual discussion um, on a very different direction here, a new documentary film focusing on a difficult topic um, of rape. For information about the screening in the film and registering for that discussion, follow They Carried Us on Facebook and on Twitter. Thanks again and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.